So uh, now the we have time for comments and questions. If there are comments from the audience, we have a microphone. Okay, so maybe, okay, thank you. Um, I think part of the failure of modern medicine is that we have promoted medicine, a biomedical model that rather than waiting and seeing, the patient expects to be treated immediately, that if they don't leave without some procedure, some diagnostic test or prescription, that somehow it's failed. Um, and so I'd, I'd like for you to address, and, and I agree with you, the problem is so much more systemic than we realize. And one of my major concerns about initiatives like patient or personalized medicine is, is that we're really not addressing those larger policy issues, those large political issues, uh, the education of the patient. Uh, you walked away, you were waiting to see because you're a physician and you know patients aren't. I think this is really problematic and, and should this be part of the agenda for a initiative like person-centered medicine? Uh, I, I think you, you raised a very important point. I mean, I, I, I tried very much to say that we have problem in the way we perceive as the state of art in medical practice today, which is looking at the disease rather than the individuals. I think we have problem with medicine today, you know, in a variety of ways. <clears throat> we sold for years medicine is the magic solution to every problem the public and patient may suffer or person may suffer, you know, from. In reality, all what we have in terms of evidence, I mean, using your the second slide you talked about, uh, we have to practice on the basis of evidence. I mean, today the evidence is so fluid, you know. All what we know about uh, the intervention which we carried out, we carry out in, in, in our practice, whether at primary care, hospital care, never exceeded 15 percent. I mean, I, I, I put that, I'm always optimistic, I put that optimistic figure. A lot of people saying even less, you know. And if you go a little bit further and, 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 and research and look at the reality of our practice, many of the things which we are doing today is questioned uh, by science, you know. We discovered that many of the clinical trials conducted over the last 30, 40 years are very much uh, actually flawed because of the way the sponsors wanted the result. This is the result I wanted, and my lovely researchers produced that result for the, the sponsor. And that's why government now actually have much better control of clinical trials and even the funding of clinical trials coming from uh, 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 different sources nowadays. The second point, which is really very important, is the effectiveness of intervention we have, you know, as a proven intervention. And I can give you from the debate and literature that, that, that there are many, many uh, uh, medicines which proved for many years as effective, now we know that they are not effective, you know. The best one is the treatment of depression. I, I tell you, we don't have any treatment for depression over the I mean, there are, uh, uh, the movement which we set up, uh, Andrew may recall, was mainly by psychiatrists, possibly only Andrew and I were not psychiatrists at that time. The PCM was led by psychiatrists. When I used to say to them, you know, there are a lot of questionable intervention on psychiatrists, you know, they used to be upset. Now I'm glad they realize it is true, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at the debate today. Today, uh, the same newspaper which uh, Sir Jonathan and I read, you know, on the plane, they were talking about statin. Because we have an institution which calls National Institute for Clinical uh, Health and Clinical Excellence saying use a statin for 
patient or those at risk when the risk of a disease is over 10%, okay? We have practitioners through the BMA saying from evidence there are more complications from statin than from the scientific evidence which you're telling us. So there is tension now between the practice and scientific evidence, you know? I mean, a lot of things which take it, t taken for granted for many years as, as, as proven uh, 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 as effective, now we discover that I talk, I'll touch about it in terms of our diagnosis of treatment tomorrow. We discovered it's not effective, you know. So, so that tension is there, you know. But the people expectation, as I showed in my slide, is so high that there are expectation for cure, expectation for immediate cure, expectation of solving their problem. We don't have the courage in, today in modern medicine to say to the people, I'm sorry, you know, uh, 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 medicine is not a linear science. We have no courage to say to the public, you know, what we can provide is limited, you know. We have no courage to say to the public, you have to take responsibility for your health, you know. We are just waiting for them. This is where I mentioned profit before health, you know? And this is the problem with the private medicine today. Can I respond to you as well? Uh, the way I read your question is that you were talking about time as a management tool, and that's good general practice, which is my area, primary health care, where most of the problems that patients present with uh, self-limiting and with undifferentiated symptoms and uh, and a good GP will often use time to see what happens. And I, I agree, you know, often patients have expectations that are contrary to that. And for me, the, the answer there is good communication. And the good communication comes from good relationships, uh, which is why I'm also sort of very uh, supportive almost of the rel what, what our, our colleagues in... Uh, in Indiana called relationship-centered care. I really like that. I think we've got a lot in common with them. Relationships, communication. is to health. Relation, interpersonal yeah. as well as uh, to health, yeah. Okay, thank you. We have more comments there. Yes. I would uh, like to support the point that James Markham made. Uh, I think if the persons that come to us, they define themselves as patients, and the more technical our approach is, the lower are their fears. And we have to have that in mind. Here we are convinced that we better should deal with persons instead of patients. But the persons that come to us, they feel themselves more, themselves more sure if we, have, uh, if we use a completely technical approach. So you are not a typical example, as you pointed out. All others would have preferred to go to the clinic, to the hospital, and to have lots of procedures done with them. And in the end, it's the same, as you said. And in the end, it's waste of money, of time, and it does not ensure the patient that his further life will be safer. <laughs> but they come to us as patients and not as persons. I just, I just respond and then Professor yeah, speak. No uh, I just want to, I just want to, just want to debate with you a little bit. Um, my father had Parkinson's, and like many people with Parkinson's, he did not like being called a patient. If you use the word patient when you write papers about people with Parkinson's, you get it edited out. They like to be called people with Parkinson's, not patients. So, I mean, that's just one point. Um, secondly, I mean, I do agree with you. Patients have expectations, and that's why I talked about communication before, albeit briefly. And it comes down to education, patient education. Yeah. Um, I don't need to say any more. I, 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 to be very honest with you, I'm taking it uh, uh, from practice and policy. And as a practitioner and policy maker, I, I, I found that the term is, doesn't make much difference because the minute I have uh, a need to seek advice, even if I'm healthy, even if I'm traveling abroad and phoning my GP or my nurse and say, look, this is, you know, 
I think you need to listen carefully to what I'm talking. My GP, my nurse, because I'm proud of this terminology. I'm very proud. Unless that attitude change, it doesn't matter whether I'm patient or person. But I, I have the, the pride of having the, te the mobile telephone of my clinic, you know. You see, I use the term, my clinic, my nurse, my GP, without thinking about it. Because it's part of me, and I'm very, very proud of this, you know. And if I show you here, you know, I don't know how many texts I receive from when I need something. I text my GP, I text the practice, you know. And I get answered. You know, again, they are moving with technology. So whether we are patient or person or public, you know, it doesn't matter. When we need help, the terminology is not important. The issue is that we in health system not spending enough to inform the people. And this is the problem, you know. The problem is we are not really working hard to inform the people about the risk of going into the wrong places, you know. Hospitals are very, very risky places. <laughs> Extremely risky places. And anybody saying otherwise is an idiot. I know how much it costs me to deal with simple hospital infection, you know. At nightmare, I lost my job nearly three times because I couldn't achieve the target. Because we have target in the United Kingdom, Jonathan knows that, you know. And, and, and I really threatened my nursing staff. I said, because this is my, my head now on the, on the, on the <laughs> job, okay? And a, a case of MRSA, for example, infection in a hospital, which is normally come from outside hospital, by the way. In most of the cases, 99% of the cases, the infection coming from outside the hospital. That's why some patients now, we have to screen before we admit them, because the hospital is a dangerous place, you know? It costs me between 100 to 200,000 a year. This is a huge waste of money, opportunity cost, you know? So why do we push patients to them? And don't forget, you know, and I, I, this is my last thing about hospital, which you need to remember. You have very, very clever, highly sophisticated people with the term of specialist or consultant, you know? They must use their time effectively, you know? And they cannot sit idle without patient. When a patient come, come to him or her, assuming that there's somebody done the screening, etc., etc., assuming, you know? So they will go to the highest level of investigation. Most of the time it's not needed. Tomorrow I'll tell you that 30% today in Britain, 30% of radical procedure done on women which is not needed. They are labeled forever, scarred forever, giving a disease which they don't have. Because there is a consultant there sitting receiving the patient and only merely suspicion, they go to Angelina Jones type style of management. This is a new terminology in medicine. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we have a couple of questions, one over there. I, I, as a practicing GP, I'd just like to pick up the ideal, idealized way in which you represent general practice and actually talk about the huge challenges there has been and, and there's major drives to actually destroy that type of medicine. And the drives are bureaucratic. For example, the COF in the UK, the whole pay for performance based on very limited, even non-evidence-based metrics was actually copied from the US. And the US have so many metrics in primary care. They have the HEDIS database, they have some other database, and people end up with 30 medications and primary care is meant to be very technical to deal with all this. And um, the UK, where actual, I think, general practice really started, abandoned it in, in the era of evidence-based medicine. Um, it wasn't the evidence-based medicine people who developed the COF, but they used the approach of evidence-based medicine and distorted evidence-based medicine and created this COF which absolutely, I mean, I practiced in the UK, did some locums there, and I was absolutely appalled. Um, so the bureaucrats, and then there's the private sector who want to take the cheap 
they want to do the quick and easy, multiple um, corporate, corporate approach, get rid of everything that's really meaningful and use simple metrics. So I just wanted to say you really need to support traditional general practice to take up this challenge. I was asking a really simplistic question. I think that question is important and <laughs> kind of merits a, 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 di a direct response. Um, that, I mean, I was just trying to, in terms of the two talks, to ask a simplistic question. I was just to say, you know, you're, the distinction between patient-centered care, which you've talked about, and what you mean by person-centeredness, I'm just trying to get a sense as to what we're actually doing with these terms. Now, Re one of the differences seems to be patient-centred care movement is rooted in a consumerist. I mean, I, you know, you talk about the language, but you know, it's patient is from agent patient. Patient was never. It's only because medicines sort of claim the term that patients is naturally contrasted to doctor. I mean, patient's original contrast term is agent, and the idea is you're on the receiving end of something. You get something. Um, isn't the di is the distinction that patient-centred care had a very much a kind of, it was sort of a consumerist movement. It had a consumerist model in the background. So you think about a lot of the people that were started off writing in it, their previous area of expertise was things like quality management movement. So there was a consumerist sort of ethos. Whereas when you're talking about person-centred care, you both seem to be putting forward a much more social-based, communitarian sort of, Influence, you know, your influence is sound. You know, I don't. You know, I'm thinking about sort of debates between sort of, uh, you know, the liberal philosophies of people like Rawls and McIntyre, which were, you know, that that bring back the notion of community into the picture. That seems to be important. How far is what you're saying different from what people have said in sort of public health debates for quite some time? I'm not saying it should be different. It might be exactly. You know, I'm not saying it ought to be different. I'm just wondering. How far is it? So you talked about things like the, the basement about banning smoking, right? Um, and the, the huge effect that that had, right? A, taking a social factor into account. Now, the thing is, the language of person-centeredness is still sort of up for grabs. So different people use it in different ways. So I was at a, di a discussion in London a little while ago. There was a chap. Uh, do we know this Professor David Nutt? Yeah, yeah. Uh, right? Fantastic. He's, sort of he's at Imperial with me. Yeah, and he's got the... Um, because he was at neuros, what's his back, neuropsychiatry? neuropsychiatry? Isn't it wonderful to be a neuropsychiatrist called David Nutt? Mm. <laughs> it's, a, it's splendid. And he is... An <laughs> Once I introduced him in a conference here in Madrid, and I yeah? said, David Nutt, I'm everyone's laughing, you know. Mm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's, he's, by the way, he's a nut. Don't yeah, worry, yeah. tell him but, um, but he's. <laughs> but the thing is, he was being, he, he was attacking the... Um, the movements in the current regime in the UK, in the Cameron regime, to um, reclassify all sorts of types of addiction as lifestyle choices. And of course, the, his opponents were putting this forward as a person-centered approach. Now, what Nutt was doing, I thought quite nicely, he said, look, when, and he had some wonderful pictures, which you know, they've tried to destroy most of them, where you have all Cameron and Boris Johnson when they were young lads smashing up restaurants and uh, uh, based on, on drug-induced behavior. And he's saying, look, lifestyle choice, right? And then he showed a group of kids in the car park yeah. uh, in a very, very bad state. And they were taking drugs. And he's like, not lifestyle choice. This is medical condition. Now, of course, some of his opponents would, would, would then characterize him as, you know, reductionist and scientific. Hey, these, are ju these kids, just because they're poorer, they're making a choice. And he wanted to oppose that. So they, the language of person-centered care, you're using it as a kind of, it seems to me, to put forward a kind of communitarian message. There are other people who are using it to put forward a, a, what you might call a sort of right-wing libertarian message. And saying yes, we, we should be cutting services to addiction because this is a lifestyle choice, uh, and that's and that's what he's vehemently, you know, Nutt was vehemently opposing. Um, and I just want you know the language is it up for grabs? Are you actually trying now to define it in a particular way to bring to say no? The difference between us and the previous patient-centered movement is we've got a communitarian approach in the background. That's why we're talking about relationships. That's why we like words like relationships. I mean, I, I, I try to answer it very quickly. You took us into a different arena, which I enjoy debating. This is so I, I suggest that after your comments, we just yeah. have time for the last comment, yeah. and then in, in the break time, we continue yeah, yeah. The, this live discussion. So 
your answer and then the last question. It's okay, of course. And then it's, it's, it's very quickly. I mean, I mean, uh, the case for substance misuse and what David Nottis said, that there is some element of revenge in it because he was kicked out of the, you know, the committee responsible for drug misuse, the government dismissed him and he decided to tackle the government in a different way. But having said that, I remember the first year, seven, eight years ago, when we did have the meeting on PCM, the entire conference literally for three days and the pre-meeting was focused on what's the difference between a person and a patient, you know? And we didn't come to any conclusion. And WHO decided, and WHO sponsored the first meeting and still sponsoring some of the meeting of the International College of Health and Central Medicine is, 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 is really saying, look, it's the person. We always talk about the person. Part of his life or every person, every person will be a patient sometime in their life. All right? And so they, they use the concept. Actually, there is a consultation document about person-centered medicine and integrated care it's not released yet, just finished by the WHO. We discussed it last, uh, first of May this year at uh, Geneva, and uh, soon will come out. Uh, the word patients don't mention it as such, you know, at the time. You know, so I wouldn't worry about that, you know, and, um, as I said, because it's beautifully described uh, uh, by Stephen, but I think it's very important to take that concept, but in practical terms, you know, uh, we should use it with the person, which is much more effective. I'll discuss with you general practice, and I always support in general practice. Yes, there are a lot of experimentation in the United Kingdom, which not necessarily based on evidence, but this is one of the strengths of our health system. Once in Thailand, we were together, Nigel Crisp, the chief executive, Sir Nigel Crisp at that time, now Lord the Crisp, asked why the NHS is one of the strongest health system in the world. And his answer was very simple in a very short sentence because we tried everything, you know, and we keep trying. It, it, it's a system with experimentation. Uh, funding hold uh, actually failed in the past, you know. Uh, cough, we introduced it to introduce element of public health and personalize the care. You so quite rightly said it, it may not uh, working. It's cu currently evaluated. It has been modified, etc. I just wanted to respond to Michael. Um, I, I think, Michael, that there has been a transition from the patient as a recipient of care to, under the rubric of patient-centred care, a model that recognises the patient as a co-producer of care or co-provider. But who is the care for? Patient-centred care sees the patient as a co-producer of care for themselves. The care is for the patient, patient primacy of patient welfare. What I think person-centered care does, at least for me, and I understand there are multiple visions and conceptualizations, this is simply my own, and I, and I'm, I, and I like the way you describe the, the, the vision I put forward as communitarian. It's, n it's care not just for the patient, it's care for all of the other people as well, the clinician, the, the partner, the, the caregiver, whoever else, if I don't, if, if, if my GP is stressed, if she is burnt out, if she is unhappy, she is, first of all, that neglects her own intrinsic right to be healthy, but it also compromises her ability to care for me as a patient. And I think these interests are really intertwined, patients, clinicians, and that's why I like the term patient, a person, because it actually sort of breaks down some of these boundaries. Um, and, 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 yeah. Well, I can talk more at morning tea as well. Okay. Like Sorry? Yes, so l last uh, comment and a tiny point from Andrew Miles, <laughs> but uh, yes, we, we, we have all the time for the break for comments, so please, Sir John. I just wanted to comment on the themes that are emerging really from the, the, the talks this morning, and you certainly, in my, uh, I, uh, in my head, you certainly dropped a bomb, which was a really wonderfully releasing kind of moment for me when uh, you talked about the moral equality, which I think we've been referring to now, 
1962, Isabel Menzies undertook a study of uh, burnout and stress in, in nurses um, in an acute medical ward at King's College Hospital in London. It became a seminal text for the profession. Um, and absolutely no answers have still been found as to what the answer is to deal with that level of um, disengagement that follows from an individual becoming um, burnt out and stressed. And the reason I believe that we try to move to patient-centered care in the profession of nursing and other professions was to respond to societal change. And I think you made a very good point, Michael. I think it is a consumerist approach where the patient is seen as the customer, somebody who pays taxes or fees and they get what they want. It doesn't matter what's right, it's they ex have an expectation as to what they want because they're paying for it either directly or indirectly. And the answer comes back in some ways to what um, Salman, you said, and it comes back to leadership. Because I believe that as healthcare professionals, we've almost become prisoners to the patient-centered concept because we see it as our emotional duty you know, it's an emotional labor to please the patient, you know. So that's, uh, uh, whereas actually, if we um, see it as a delight, as joyful caring, something that we, is, is a wonderful thing to do, then we can only do that if the patients understand who we are mm -hmm. and understand that we live as a community. And um, if it was a few hundred years uh, ago, it would be us as part of the community who happen to have skills that could provide care for our fellow citizens. And um, I think that when you, look at the hist when you look at what we as managers, as both of you and I have been, um, the key thing is if the leadership promotes joyful caring as the approach to the value of this organization, and we set our systems up as being those which actually communicate that to our patients, are, are the people who come to our surgeries. I mean, I have the very same relationship with my surgery in Oxford as, as, as you do, Salman. It, 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 it is not a second thought for me to no. just, well, I have to only walk up the road or phone them. Mm -hmm. They are absolutely person-centered, exactly. but I know what I have to do. I have responsibilities yeah. too, absolutely. as a patient, uh, which we have negotiated. Yes. Um, and I think you see this in some specialties, and, and maybe some specialties are not others. So it's about the renegotiation of the contract uh, and, and actually bringing ourselves out of the dark. I could go on about general practice forever and totally agree with what uh, what, what said, but I think we've got a challenge to change ourselves. And when we changed, when we changed, and last point, when we changed uh, the cardiovascular, uh, uh, um, when we changed the cardiovascular practice, I was chairing a reconfiguration of health services in North Manchester. And the biggest challenge we had getting the PCI service established at the Manchester Royal Infirmary was the bloody cardiologists themselves who had to change the day they were playing golf because they had to go on call. And some actually opted out. But that was their choice.